Welcome to this LSE Festival session, How to Future Proof Your Career, part of our Skills for a Fast Changing World series, hosted by LSE Online. Whilst we give another minute for people to arrive, like we posted in the chat box, we'd love to hear where you're joining us from in the world. I can see from Brussels, Nepal, Hong Kong, Philippines, it's great to have such an international audience. Greece, Armenia, Malaysia. This one's beautiful. That's amazing. Florida. Bahrain. This is a great idea. Fantastic. Dominican Republic. Nigeria. Amazing. Ghana. Oh, fantastic. Abu Dhabi. This is amazing. I think this is our most international audience so far, Grace. It is. And I'm really excited. I'm honestly really excited to see people coming from so many places in the world. Thank you. Thank you for the privilege of your time today. I'm Dr. Jasmine Viria. I'm a behavioural scientist at the Inclusion Initiative, a research centre based at the LSE. My current research focuses on exploring what flexibility, productivity and inclusion within organisations means to diverse workforces across the banking, finance, legal and tech industries. Today, I'm speaking to Dr. Grace Lorden, the founding director of the Inclusion Initiative and an associate professor at the LSE. Grace is an economist and her research is focused on quantifying the benefits for inclusion within and across organisations, as well as designing interventions to level the playing field for underrepresented talent. She's also the convener of the LSE's online course, Inclusive Leadership Through Behavioural Science. This is a course which enables you to navigate the science behind inclusivity and learn how to create a culture of collaboration and engagement. You'll find Grace's academic writings in top international journals, and she often writes for the Financial Times and Harvard Business Review. Grace is an expert advisor to the UK government, sitting on their Skills and Productivity Board, as well as their Social Mobility Task Force. And she's also a member of the Advisory Board for the Women in Finance Charter. Today, we're going to be talking about future-proofing your skills, and Grace's first book, think big, take small steps and build the future you want. We absolutely encourage questions. We're going to spend around 15 to 20 minutes answering these towards the end of the session. If you see questions that you would really like answering, please upvote them and I will make sure to get to as many of these as possible. And just in case you need a little bit of extra encouragement, Grace is going to be giving away three copies of her book and this will be based on um, the questions that get the most votes so please do post those um and i'll announce the winners towards the end of the session so i think we're ready to get started grace my first question is are you optimistic or pessimistic about the future of work i'm optimistic about the future of work i think the trends in technology really um imply that people who are doing work that's boring routine are going to be helped by technology ultimately. So whether you do physical labor, it's going to get a bit easier on your physicality. Whether you do labor inside in an office, kind of the type of work that you do, Jasmine, actually, it's going to get much easier to do the type of research that you do because everything points to the fact that we're going to have machines substitute for the harder bits mm -hmm. and be complements for the easier bits. But my pessimism comes with government. So I think governments aren't doing enough to future-proof their populations, and in particular, the transition period in the learning of skills. So what I mean by that is I would love governments to take seriously how they can actually, actually capture the rent of the robots, the machines that are taking on you know, the, the human jobs in a way that people get to live with a living wage while they're upskilling for these kind of fantastic jobs that will be created. Sure. OK, so would you say that there's a skill that you think is future-proof? So I think if you want to be future proof, really look at your soft skills. And I, I, I use if you read Think Big and I still think this is the case. Um, resilience is super important because I think, you know, the world of work is unpredictable at the moment. People will suffer knocks and it's really important that they don't internalize them to the extent that it gets them down. Adaptability, curiosity, creativity are also skills that I really encourage our audience to hone. Um, but I think ultimately becoming an expert in something 
Mm. and also being able to join the dots across disciplines that aren't your own and that's why I love hanging out with you Jasmine because you're very <laughs> different in background to me you see the world differently and I think you bring different dots into our group actually and then if we join those dots together I think we'll end up being much more creative than other people who just stay in their discipline silos yeah or you've said before that you only used to hang out with economists before and that's changed now. <laughs> I was I was a very I have to say I I I I I'm sorry I kept there's a lot of things that I wish I changed earlier in my life and that is one of them I think it's absolutely amazing to know the major insights from all of the the big disciplines that are out there in the world and some of the more narrow ones because ultimately creativity isn't you sitting alone in your room coming up with something new. It's exposing yourself to the new ideas of others and seeing a new way in which they can actually come together. Yeah, maybe that's something we could put to the audience as well. What skill you think is future proof? Um, and we yes. could, we'll, we'll display a word cloud of all of your answers. So please do pop those in. That's an amazing idea. So for the audience, and given that you're from so many different contexts, we'll probably get very different answers. What do you think is the one skill that is the most future proof? Let's see what comes in. Can we move on to the next question in the meantime? Yeah. Oh, they're coming through chat as well. They're coming through chat. Wow. There's some great options there. So let me gather them up. So we have communication coming through Word Cloud. Resilience, yes. Resilience, being open to change, continued learning, flexibility, empathy, um, leadership, communication, being open to change, empathy, flexibility, continued learning, continued learning, being open to change, adaptability, creativity. Yes, mathematical reasoning, absolutely. The STEM subjects will remain important. Interpersonal skills, oh, wow. That's what this is a really, yeah, this is a really clue, a clue in audience. And I will say for those of you who said resilience in the chat, um, there I have a full chapter dedicated to resilience in Think Big. So do ask a question, get it upvoted so you get your free copy. <laughs> Can you share with us what the inspiration was behind Think Big? Yeah, you know, I was, like I said, I hung around a lot with economists and economists have a really nasty habit of pointing out problems. So I did that for a number of years of my career where I would come and I would talk about the gaps in success across groups, the gaps in people's earnings that weren't attributed to themselves. I was particularly interested in discrimination. So you can imagine if you were somebody who was being discriminated against, having somebody say over and over again that what you felt was true isn't very helpful without them offering a solution. And when I went to, comp nobody said anything to me in academia actually about this, and I published in quite good journals. When I was talking companies, and I used to give a, a, a talk and I would talk about the solutions all at the firm level. So I would say, you need to change your recruitment process. Maybe you're, you should blind CVs. Maybe you should change how you form the panel. Maybe you should change who's on the panel um, in order to kind of protect against discrimination and against favoritism. Yeah. And at the end of these, and um, you know, there used to be a 200 something people um, who would work in these companies often, and some young people said it to me actually in, in, in the audience, but very often they would come to me privately and say, I enjoyed your talk up to the point where you gave me no solution. So you talked about the problem. You talked about what the CEO can do and the HR can do. What if the person at the top of the organization doesn't care about discrimination and doesn't care about favoritism? What if the director of HR doesn't care about favoritism and doesn't care about discrimination? What do I do as an individual? And that's really what Think Big is. It's getting people to focus on what are the things that you can actually control on your own career journey. Um, there's a lot about self-management. So managing your time, um, managing the bias that are inside ourselves. And we all have them. You know, people suffer from imposter syndrome, risk aversion, um, really becoming much more self-aware. And also how you tackle the biases that other people might actually throw at you. Um, and what I really tried to do in Think Big, and it, 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 it was hard because I was coming from this prism where everything should be fair in the, in, in the world and the company, the director, the CEO, the director of HR, they should take care of things that go wrong. Um, but ultimately this book is actually about the person themselves. So whether you're at the start of your career, whether you're at the middle and you've plateaued, whether you're much later in life and you want to pivot, or maybe you don't know what you want to do with your life. I think looking at Think Big and taking behavioral science, which is our discipline, um, which isn't a discipline, but brings lots of disciplines together, seriously as a mechanism for you to have change is definitely worth a go. 
Mm. And would you say that's what makes Think Big stand out from the other career management books that are out there? Yes, I think it's very heavily referenced. So when I started, Jasmine, I will tell you, I wrote it for academics. So yes. Penguin, the publisher, wasn't so happy with me. They said, you need to write it for a bigger audience. So the starting point was really to make sure that it was heavily cited, that everything that I was actually saying was backed up by evidence. I'm really cautious in Think Big, and I think too few academics are cautious in this. You know, most research is done in a very specific context. So it might be done in a laboratory at the London School of Economics. It might be done in London with a subset of, of, of people who have a lot in, in common. Ultimately, a lot of behavioral science research neglects people who are from Western, educated, industrialized, rich developed countries. So we have a very small set of kind of populations who are being studied. So I really lean towards being an evaluator. So I ask everybody if they make a change in their life that I recommend and think big that they evaluate it themselves. Yeah. And I've gotten lots of people writing to me about things that have worked for them and which is even more important, things that don't work. And again, it is kind of this journey of what are the things that I need to do in order to make me more productive, more content, and ultimately make sure my career is progressing even if there were people around me who are putting stumbling blocks in my way. Sure. Um, speaking to that, can you talk about why you suggest small steps versus big steps in this in navigating your career journey? Well, I think it's personal because I think anybody who knows me will know that I'm not really somebody who can do something very, very quickly all in one go. But I think more than that, that describes most of the world. So there's very few overnight success stories. And actually, even if there are overnight success stories, you, you scratch the hood and you see somebody who's been working towards something for a very, very long time, perhaps silently. Um, there's nothing that you can do in your life that's sustainable that isn't something that's a marathon, to, you, to use a cliche. And I think ultimately, if you reflect on what you're doing now, Jasmine, today, or, or I reflect on what I'm doing now, and the small things that we're doing regularly, weekly as habits, that's who you're going to be in five years time. So for most of us, it's too hard to make big changes anyway, we set ourselves up for failure. But embedding habits in your day, in your week, that are small enough that it doesn't yank your happiness, that it doesn't disrupt your life really gives a sustainable solution towards career progression. So on the one hand, it's for me to not have a heart attack that I have to do something so big that it's going to put me so much out of my comfort zone. So I want people tippy toes outside of their comfort zone. And on the second, there's a really good science behind disproportionately small things that you do on a day to day basis have these huge impacts on your life. Yeah. Would you say that's one of your main takeaway pieces of advice for people that are at the point of either selecting or rethinking their careers? Yes. So there's lots of books that will talk about quitting your job. And I think those books are written by people who probably earn an incredible living and would never quit their job, you know, to begin with. I think for anybody who's thinking about changing their careers, you should be taking a small step outside your comfort zone. Think in terms of, of side hustle. Think in terms of building your network. And think in terms of the small things that will mean that you can make that jump without making yourself both financially insecure and insecure with your happiness, which ultimately, when we live in uncertainty, which it would be to quit your job and start something new without knowing anything about it, it really does play havoc with our well-being. Yeah, yeah. And do you think fit, that fear is what holds people back from making this change? It is. And, you know, I think that so as human beings, we tend to see things as all or nothing. So we tend to see, well, I've invested, you know, five years of my life in a degree. I can't change because if I change, I have to do something entirely different again. Or if I've invested five years working for one company, it's hard to change because I might miss, miss, miss the next promotion. And I think what I try to do and think big is get people thinking about not change in terms of all or nothing, but change as incremental. So you try something new for three months. If it doesn't work out, you go back to doing what you were always doing. The fact that you found a book on careers and kind of self-growth anyway means that you do want to change. So giving yourself that three months to be an experimenter without having any huge disruption in your life is really something that you should give to yourself. Okay, no, that sounds good. What do you think is one of the main reasons that a person would decide to leave their job or perhaps rethink their career? I think let's ask the audience that first because I'm really curious to see what they what they would say so if you can imagine 
yourself in a job and you're just about to quit, what would be the main reason that you would give for quitting your job? And if it's easy, do put it into the into the word cloud. Oh, stagnation, manager. Yeah. 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 So toxic culture, manager, line manager, boss, burnt out, the environment, mental health, company culture, bullying. Yes, definitely bullying. Lack of career progression, values that not align, pay, a boring job, job satisfaction, working for a bully, working for a bully. Yeah, that is horrendous. Childcare, when you are stagnated, anxiety, lack of interest, lack of work, poor life balance, boring work. So new, a, a big selection coming through, but a lot of them actually centering around who you ultimately work with um, and who your manager is, who your leader is, who your line manager is. And that really also comes true in the literature as well. So everything that's been said comes true in the literature. Like, you know, so we have, I think we have the things that are on the bottom tail that shouldn't happen to anybody, like have being exposed to a toxic culture, being exposed to bullying, being exposed to isolation. This should not be happening in 2022. And then we have the kind of more general reason that people choose to leave as their manager. So they, they, they're they not necessarily kind of getting opportunities that they want to grow. I can see here that some people are saying that they're not feeling valued. So again, that comes from being in the team, lacking respect. Um, yes, so I, I, I agree with the audience on this one, Jasmine. I think it really does come down to the line manager um, and ultimately what the, what, what the line manager is actually kind of how they're treating people in front of them and whether or not they're an effective leader. What, what would you say makes an effective leader? I mean, I think if you have a diverse team, the most important thing that you can do is pay attention to whether you equalize opportunities, you equalize visibility and you equalize voice. I think, you know, all of the kind of trimmings that come going out for drinks together, going out to eat together, having fun together, people should feel comfortable doing that, but they shouldn't be in place of opportunities, visibility and voice. And I think, you know, if, if we think about kind of diversity and inclusion, which obviously you mentioned that we both work together in the inclusion initiative. One thing that I'm really, really conscious of is that we wouldn't need HR policies and we wouldn't need um, government mandates and government quotas if every single manager and leader was, one, giving equal opportunities, visibility and voice, and two, hiring with a wide talent pool based on merit. And I think that doesn't actually happen organically. So you mentioned the LSC course in the beginning, and I know somebody in the chat has mentioned continuous learning. And that really all is all about creating effective leaders, but now we call them inclusive leaders. So I'm hoping in 10 years time that what we're teaching and what we're doing will be called effective leadership and effective team building, Jasmine. Do you think that um, a sign of being an effective or inclusive leader is being able to have your employees approach you for advice on your career and the feedback that's necessary to help you navigate that career. Absolutely. So I think to be an effective leader, it should be that people are coming and saying, this is what I would love to do with the next five years of my life. And I think the person shouldn't panic if, 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 if the, 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 the person in their team who's talking to them doesn't want to be sitting next to them for the rest of their life. I think that's part of career journeys. Ultimately, you when you hire somebody, you obviously hire them to do a job and to do it well. But part of the exchange part, and I think some people who are managing forget that, is that you do give people opportunities to shine. You do give people opportunities to be seen. And maybe for the person in your team, they want to go somewhere else. So maybe they want to try, you know, and we, we have these discussions, and I know, in the inclusion initiative where I'm really open to people who might want to try consultancy or go into industry and helping people navigate the path that way. And I think ultimately that will help bring people back to us rather than help and um, push people away. So yes, I, I, I definitely think it's, it would be a very weird thing if people in your team weren't coming to you asking you for career advice. And I think if they're not, you should be offering to them, look, I'm here, my door's always open if you want to talk about other strategies in which you might want to move in, in another direction. Yeah, yeah. We often hear that feedback is a gift and I wondered whether you believe that to be true or whether you think that there's a dark side to receiving feedback? It's a, re it's, it's a great question in theory. Uh, in, in theory, feedback is great, right? Mm -hmm. And I am somebody, for uh, everyone who knows me, and I know they'll say it's true, I hate 
positive fluffy feedback so you know the tendency where you say something good you say something bad you say something good that really drives I, I really just want people to say good job except for and then to tell me ev ev everywhere where I went wrong and I think that's a special personality type and I think most people entangle their output with themselves so their output is one thing where they obviously put some work into it and there's factors outside their control that allows for that output. And then there's the person who they are out in the world with their family, with their friends, who is actually a separate, a separate person. And I think kind of part of the job for me has been learning about how to give feedback in a style actually that's different to what I, what I prefer. Um, but my experience of feedback, I think as an individual aligns with um, a lot of the literature which says two thirds of the people after receiving negative feedback do actually become demotivated in work. So when, if you're listening and you're a researcher, I think there's a lot of work to be done on how to deliver a feedback in a way that's actually effective and useful for the person in the long run without damaging their self-esteem in, the in, in, in the short run. And I think that also falls under effective leadership. Yeah, and I guess, and there's an example of this in your book as well about who you go to for this feedback as well, who you're asking for. So do you think that networking is critical there and do you think it's critical for future proofing your career and the decisions you make in pursuing a new career for example yes i think the worst thing that somebody can do for themselves is have one mentor and that's the only person who they ask for help i think in the first case it's only one person so they won't see all of the opportunities that are open to you i think in the second case if the mentor were to say something that wasn't true didn't necessarily align with your personal values, you're left then with one big piece of feedback and you don't necessarily know what to do with it. And in Think Big, I, I, I say the minimum amount of people that you should have is three people. And they should be absolutely independent of each other. So they should be your challenge network in the sense that if you go to person A, they're definitely likely to say something different to person B and person C. And having that, firstly, I think, lets us grow as, as humans. We're open to perspectives from diverse people in our network. But secondly, it also benefits you because they'll see those opportunities, Jasmine, that that one person might not necessarily see for you. So kind of often, if I'm stuck, I'll often say to people, look, what, what would you do if you were in my shoes or your friend was in my shoes? What would you do? And, and you, you do get very, very different ideas. But then the joy of feedback is that it's not a democracy. You get to take it away and you decide ultimately what the course of action is. So I, for everybody who's in the audience, regardless of the stage of your career, not being scared of critical feedback is really, really important. And always keeping control of your decisions and not letting other people make them for you. Yeah, and I think that's really important. Um, if there is someone in the audience and quite hopefully quite a few people that are thinking of embarking on their think big journey, to future proof their career what advice would you have for them oh i think the first thing is to imagine what you would be doing in the medium term like three four five years without any constraints so really take away all of the constraints that might be on yourself so that you don't think you're good enough that you don't have the skills that you don't have the network that you're living in the wrong city and then once you've done that think about what are the tasks that you would be doing on a day-to-day -day basis if it worked out and if you think you would be happy doing those tasks, go and get experience of those tasks. And if you need people to help you access those tasks, expand your network um, to allow you, you know, if, if what you want to do is be with myself and Jasmine here at an LSE public event, you can look to see what would you be doing at LSE on a day to day basis? What would the tasks actually be? How can you get more experience of public speaking? Potentially reach out to Jasmine or myself for advice, because that's probably the one thing that we, 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 we can give you advice on. But really expanding not just what you're doing on a day to day basis um, through new activities, but also your network. OK, great. I think we'll go over to the audience questions because we have loads, which is great. So my first one is from Sonia Wolf. Should we be preparing ourselves for a future in which we have multiple careers? Yes, I think that I, you know, I think ultimately, if you think big, I always challenge to people to think outside the linear titles like lawyer, doctor, um, and these kind of one type of careers that we tend to kind of hook, hook our net on and imagine ourselves doing for the, for the rest of our lives. 
I think it's good to think, think in terms of tasks. What would you like to be doing on a day-to-day -day basis if it all works out? Um, and then with those tasks, think about what job or jobs will allow you to do them. And I think the future of work is pushing more towards a task-based approach to work for two reasons. Firstly, industries are changing. So knowing what tasks you're actually good at allows you to write a CV for a very, very different sector to what you're in. Um, but secondly, the future does suggest portfolio careers are on the rise. Um, and I also think portfolio careers can be incredibly exciting, actually, um, if you can balance it. So, you know, you might be working 50% in a job that's very, very traditional. And then for the remainder 50% of the time, you're doing two or three other activities that um, commit to your income stream. And, and by the way, that strategy has been a strategy for investors in the stock market for a very, very long, long period of time. So I'm not surprised to see it coming out of the labor market when we have so much uncertainty that people are looking to diversify their income um, um, streams so they don't end up not being able to pay the rent, not being able to buy food. But there's so many people, Jasmine, I know who've done that successfully to an extent where they're earning, you know, triple four times more than you are, you and I are. So if you're motivated by money, I think a portfolio career is definitely worth exploring. Okay. Um, Alexandra asks, building the future you want assume, assumes you know what you want. What's your advice for those of us who are still figuring out what we want? Well, I think, Alexandra, you should get people to upvote your question because in Think Big, I have a book for exactly this. And I, I think it comes down to looking at the type of skills and looking at the type of activities that people typically do within jobs and figuring out what you would hate to do. So crossing those off, I never want to do those. Figuring out what you're indifferent to, which, you know, I mean, I do some, I do a decent amount of admin with my job, which I'm quite indifferent to. I would give it away if I could, but I, so, so, but it doesn't disturb me. It doesn't, it doesn't really harm my well-being. And then the things that you actually love doing, which for me is, you know, spending time with students, spending time with our alumni, meeting new people, having having talks like this. I do wish I could see people. I keep looking at the <laughs> questions to try to see the faces. But yes, I, I wish I wish I could I wish I could see people. And then from that, asking yourself, what are the jobs in which I can actually do these tasks? So what are the jobs in which I can do these things that I love? And that really will give you a hint of what you want to do. And then you just go and get experience in that task and figure out if you actually love it. And for me, that's been learning in itself. There's things that I thought I would enjoy doing that when I actually got to do them, I realized actually not for me. So this is a real learning learning curve. And, and you know, I, I will say Alexandra is in really good company because Oscar Wilde has a really famous quote that um, discusses the idea that people who are born knowing what they want to do are, are the ones who are at a deficit. And it's the people who are constantly learning, constantly moving throughout tasks, constantly moving throughout life, actually end up being um, the, the, the much better off. So if you won't take it from me, take it from Oscar Wilde. Yeah. Just start thinking about what are the activities that I enjoy doing and try and get into a, a job that allows you to do those activities. Um, we've had quite a few questions on resilience and Yik Bo Ting has asked, I want to be more resilient and adaptable, but because it's a soft skill, it's difficult to quantify or build structure, unlike professional certifications. How can I build resilience with credibility? So this is a really great question. So you are right. We, we don't know how to teach resilience yet. So it's still being figured out how to teach soft skills and how to teach them well in the, in the school in how you teach mathematics. We do know how to measure resilience. And there's a number of different instruments that you can actually use to measure resilience. So if you're an individual who's trying to hone your resilience, I think you should use one of the validated questionnaires regularly. And by regularly, it can be monthly. Um, so it, it, it doesn't need to be a big commitment in your life. It takes about five or six minutes. And you basically then have some idea about what your base level of resilience is. And then you should experiment on yourself and figure out what will actually make you more resilient. And there's two things that I would suggest you bear in mind. So I think the first are we have a store of resilience. So if Jasmine and I have an argument today, it's likely to deplete my, my stores of resilience because I like Jasmine very much and I would feel quite emotional about it. And I'm sure Jasmine would feel exactly the same. So both of our resilience levels actually goes down. So if we were to have an argument today, 
one of the best things that we could do as individuals is take some time to lick our wounds because that emotional response is really important. But then the next day, come back and have a conversation and actually work it out. That second, that second part is fundamentally so important. Um, and that's a really good tip for resilience. So when negative things happen to you, you should become self-aware to the point that you will know that you need a break from the situation in order to get your emotions in check. And then in the second part of it, and you might need help from your, your, your diverse boardroom in navigating this, depending on the situation. But in your second part of it, you go back into the conversation with a very, very cool head. So thinking about managing those interactions differently. The other thing that I would suggest for resilience is that we are drawn to losses. So as human beings, we focus on what we lose. We focus on things that aren't working out for, our, for, for us. We focus on the negative. And that's every single person, regardless of what country in the world you're looking at, unless you become mindful. Um, and at the end of each day, you can choose to write it down, which is actually quite a nice log to look back on your life from somebody who doesn't journal. Um, you can choose to write it down or you can choose to do this in your head on, on your commute home. But just thinking about what were the small wins that I actually had today or the big wins if, if you got lucky. But what were the things that actually worked out? And that could be from a really good conversation that Jasmine and I had, for example, which normally somebody wouldn't take as a small win. But if we have an argument, we ruminate on that. So it's important to really kind of think, actually, I had a really good conversation with Jasmine today, my colleague. Um, it could be a small win where you got a call back for a public speaking engagement. It could be a small win where you just got a task done because you were a procrastinator. But really drawing your attention to those, because that's actually what will kind of keep you going when things don't necessarily feel that they're going your way. And I think something that's really interesting is during COVID, people who did that, did much better in terms of mental health and happiness as compared to people who don't. Um, but if you do, um, if you if you do win the book today, um, there's a whole chapter on resilience on tips just like that. And I'd encourage you to apply them and monitor your resilience levels. So really figuring out whether or not you're going up or down and what's actually working for you. Okay. Um, Lorraine Phillips has asked, how can we bring sustainability and inclusivity fully into the design of organizations or products, for example? Oh, it's a really great question. So I think to kind of give you some background on what's happening in organizations at the moment, um, we're in a compliance phase of diversity and inclusion. And that really is because the CEOs of most organizations recognize that diversity and inclusion is good for business, or they know actually that it wouldn't look good for them to, so, to say otherwise. So they get their HR department to bring in things like monitoring promotions, monitoring pay rises, monitor, monitoring recruitment. What we're missing is the culture phase where each and every manager who is within that organization is an effective leader or an inclusive leader, which, which, whichever, whichever, wording that you, um, whichever wording that you want. And then it becomes the fabric of the organization. And I'm a really big advocate in training managers to become inclusive leaders. Again, all an inclusive leader is, is somebody who gives opportunities, voice and visibility to every person in their team um, and makes sure that they take steps in the recruitment round to bring more diversity into their team. But what an inclusive leader also is, is somebody who recognizes that diversity is good for business. Now, if I wanted today to create, innovate or assess risk, I, I shouldn't want to hire myself. I shouldn't want nine more graces sitting around the table and everybody having the same hobbies as me, everybody having the same sense of humor as me. But that's what people do too often because they want to feel comfortable at work. They want to feel that at every moment, there'll be a predictable kind of group of people who will go behind their decisions. And I think until we move to a place where the person who's hiring, whether it's the mid-level manager and the people at the top of the organization really believe that diversity is good for business. They read not in terms of socially responsible, in terms of bringing along the business in terms of serving its customers, as, as has been mentioned in the question, being more innovative, being more creative and allowing for a long lasting business. We're going to be stuck in that compliance phase where people who are, ha, have been underrepresented for a long time get jobs in companies, are often forced to conform, and we're not getting the best out of their diversity. They're not necessarily getting to be themselves. 
This is something that I'm the next question I know is something that you touch on in the book, actually. To what extent can a focus on ourselves blind us to the fact that some things happen due to systemic or pure luck factors? And can this be detrimental to our well-being? That's from Oliver Chaplin. I think it's a great, I know the answer. You should give the answer, given that you remember it. Well, go, you should go. <laughs> um, the fact that there are certain things that are beyond our control. Um, that we then need to you put you put me on the spot now <laughs> <laughs> go on grace yeah you're, you're spot on where you were going by the way yes so it so when when anything happens i think it's really important to assess whether or not it was down to your input and you were the cause or whether it's down to sheer blind luck now all of us on this call will be subject to good luck and bad luck Bad luck isn't the same as coming up against discrimination, by the way. So bad luck is facing a judge who's just had his wisdom teeth pulled out um, on, on, on a particular day and, and, and is feeling quite grumpy. It's, it, 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 it's quite random. So I think you need to think about, were people unfair to me? Did I face bad luck? Or was it down to my inputs? And if it was down to your inputs, be honest with yourself and just correct it for the next time around. So you know, anytime I make a mistake, I'm really conscious whether or not I made a mistake and then I make efforts to correct it in the next in the in the in the next phase. And I think as somebody who, who you know, who, who works for an employer, for somebody who is a student, that's all that we can ask for ourselves as humans. We're going to make mistakes as humans, particularly if, like me, you suffer from procrastination. There's going to be times where you could have put in more effort and it didn't quite make the mark. You have to be honest about that um, in order for you as yourself as an individual to actually get it right the next time. So if you are always feeling you fall on bad luck, start diarizing and really try to pinpoint where you might be able to change the process. Um, and, and again, you should see things going a bit more your way in that particular case, because usually um, we, do, we're not, we, we don't fall on bad luck forever. Yeah. Um, Clara asks, how do we react when a life event pushes us to make decisions or include considerations that don't align with what we are passionate about? I think here you should try not to think about things as all or nothing. So, you know, I've been in, in situations in my life. So, for example, when I finished my um, my degree, um, my mom got ovarian cancer and I, I stayed in my hometown in Cork to care for her while I was doing while I was doing my master's, which was really important to me. And I wasn't necessarily able to take the opportunities that I would have wanted to take that were outside my hometown. Um, but I stayed and I did two things. So firstly, I started teaching. Uh, I started a teaching assistant job for the head of department. And secondly, I did a master's um, in economics, which ultimately led to me getting a scholarship for my PhD. So I was really cognizant of. I wanted to do something. I wasn't 100% sure of my path, and I've always been honest about that. And even today, I'm not 100% sure of my path, but I knew I wanted to do something. I knew I wanted to keep moving ahead. So ask yourself, how can I kind of keep moving ahead and honor the constraints that are around me? Um, and I think as well, and I use that example, um, I, I, use, I use that example particularly because I, in my mind, I had no choice. I wanted to be with my mom. That was my preference at that particular moment. That you will feel in your job that you're held down by constraints that perhaps are there for other people are put around you by other people that are unfair. So maybe you think that you should have an opportunity and you're not being given that opportunity. And again, think about how can I actually control that situation and navigate my way out of it so that I get an opportunity. But there's always for everybody who's on the call today, there's going to be times in your life where you just want to spend time with your kids when they're young where there's somebody who belongs to you sick and you want to spend time with them, where maybe you just want to go off on your own and go interrailing around Europe. And you should absolutely prioritize that in those moments. Life is long and career is, is long, but thinking about what can I also do that keeps me moving on that career journey, really small steps in the time when I'm, when I'm taking care of something else. I've just lost the question I was going to ask. One There's second. loads. It's brilliant. There's just so many. Uh, where is it gone? It was about utilising your network. Sorry, let me... Here we go. I've built a very good network in the past few years. However, I'm not sure if I'm utilising the network in a good way, especially my close circle who are working in my area, as I feel kind of embarrassed to ask for an opportunity. How would you suggest 
overcoming that embarrassment? Well, I think the first thing to say is when it comes to asking for help, we tend to underestimate the amount of times a person is actually going to say yes. So most of us, most people really want to help others, right? You don't want a huge tax in your time, but you really want to help others. So for the person who's sitting, um, what was the name of the person who gave the question, Jasmine? Oh, uh, anonymous. anonymous. Oh, anonymous. Yeah. So for, 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 for anonymous, I think the first thing to say is really internalize the fact that the chances of you being told no are much, much smaller than you actually recognize. Much, much, much smaller. And I think the second thing is to think about life in this way is reciprocal. So if you can't help the person who you're asking for help for, think about a way to pay it forward. And, you know, Adam Grant has a great paper that actually shows that for individuals who highlighted that they were willing to pay it forward and help somebody else when they were asking for help, were much more likely to be told yes, as compared to people who just really outlined the benefit for themselves. But I think if you haven't asked for help in a very, very long time, just get just just do get on with it. You know, most people who you will reach out to, particularly if they're in your network, really will want to help you on your way. They mightn't be able to give you everything, um, but they will definitely be able to point you um, towards opportunities. They will definitely be able to point you to other, towards other people who might be more help. And I think more than anything, it will actually show you that when you reach out for help, it tends to be quite a pleasant experience. Yeah. Um, Wami Ashiru asks, which would be better for a future-proof career, being a jack of all trades or an expert in one area? I think, I mean, to be to really reach the top, I think you need what's called T-shaped skills. So you need to have some expertise. There needs to be something that people will come to you for that they can't necessarily get anywhere else. And that can be the typical things like science, maths, economics, anthropology, sociology, or it can actually be just being a connector. So just being somebody who actually connects other individuals, you need to have an expertise and a skill that others don't have. And I think the second part then is to be able to converse across other disciplines. So as you move forward in your career, really paying attention to, can I join the dots across disciplines that aren't my own? Or am I in a silo just talking to individuals like me? And if you get that right, um, so if you get it right where you have one expertise, where we know what to come to you for, and you're also out there having conversations with people who are across a number of industries, then you will have a very, very successful career in the future. And it allows you to be much more adaptable. Yeah, that links to Amir Zahn's question. Um, people talk a lot about adaptability and willingness to change a career path, but how plausible is it to compete with people who have a strong academic background and practical experience in an area? Do you think that a fresh view of an outsider can be an important component for an employer? So I think my answer to that last part is absolutely yes. I think, unfortunately, the labour market isn't there yet where enough people agree with me that you see that shining through. So we still get in the early stages of labour markets an overfocus on people who have particular academic backgrounds going into particular jobs. If you want to move and you want to do something that's outside your academic expertise, I think it really comes down to what we've been talking to all the time get practice in doing the tasks that are needed in that occupation ever before you apply for that role to allow you to write the CV for it. Um, and you know, there was this expression that one of my early lecturers used in my um, undergraduate in computer science where he would say, you're only really as good as the last thing that you did. So if for example, somehow, Jasmine, you, 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 you came here today and this was your very, very first day on earth um, and you completed a project that really knocked things out of the park, regardless of you having no history in a particular occupation, you will get the accolades for that, that project. So for the person who asked that question, think about what you can actually do to get voice, visibility and opportunities in the field that you might want to move into. And then really just go for it. Um, if you're if you're really kind of stuck to the idea of doing an academic qualification, I'd also look at masters, which tend to be one year as opposed to being three or four years like undergraduate degrees um, or indeed executive masters, which you can actually do while you are working as a way to bridging the skills and getting the signal, because that's all that's what an academic uh, degree is, is a signal that you're proficient in, in something. 
Um, but one thing that is progressing, and particularly within technology, are companies not asking for degrees anymore. So they're asking people to complete task-based assessments. And I think this is a trend that will continue over the next decade. Yeah. And do you think that, um, so we have a question in here. There was a thing a couple of years ago whereby coding was meant to be a silver bullet for all declining professions, such as coal miners, truck drivers, but that hasn't necessarily worked out. Consequently, how do we ensure that upskilling does not turn into outright patronizing of people currently in less than glamorous professions? Um, and how can this advice be tailored to um, non mid and upper class white collar professions? So those that haven't necessarily gone down the education route, for example. I mean, I think this, and, and, and the question is spot on. I think this was really bad advice, Jasmine. I think, you know, coding is a global market and a lot of the jobs are actually on the global market. So to just upskill yourself in coding in order to move industries hasn't actually, I, I, I'm not surprised that, that, that it, hasn't, it hasn't been enough. I think there's kind of two things for the future. We started talking about whether or not I'm optimistic and pessimistic. And I think for people not to feel the pains of transition, governments really do need to step up and start capturing some of the rents from technology. And those rents need to be put into systems that create skills that allow people to actually be employed in the labor market. And if their skill becomes redundant and they need to go back and upskilled, it guarantees them a certain amount of income. And that might sound like blue sky, pie in the sky thinking, but the rents from technology that are coming through industries at the moment are incredibly high and they're definitely, definitely not being captured. And I think if we were to get the government to have a system like this, then some of the problems in this question actually go away. Because if you have people who are moving out of whether it's from being a coal miner or from a professional career that has been machinized into something new, the education system is there for you. I think in the absence of that, I come back to the small steps. And for that particular person, really identifying what are the tasks that you need to do in order to get into a job that you actually want now? And can you get experience of doing those tasks? And really leaning on the kind of democratizing of education in order to get you there if you don't have financial funds. I know that a lot of jobs do require signals of bachelor's degrees, master's degrees, and PhDs, and that's never going to go away. But I think what is coming on stream are a number of managers and companies as well who are saying, actually, alongside those traditional signals, we're going to test people. And I think there's so many really high quality programs online that are free or that are low cost that people can, can jump on to upskill. So I'm hopeful for the education system, but I tend to hope for some things that never come, Jasmine. So in the meantime, to kind of empower people really taking those small steps. Um. Do you think now more than ever that life is so uncertain we should we should take more risks professionally? I think we should always take more risks professionally. You know, I think most of us have a fear of standing out. We really do. I mean, we don't like the idea that people might actually be looking on us if we get it wrong, if we make a mistake, if we fluff up. Uh, and ultimately, I think one of the most important lessons that I've learned in my life that is actually backed up by um, behavioral science evidence is we think the spotlight is on us and very often it isn't. People aren't paying attention to us. They're not noticing that we didn't do things perfectly. And actually the people who do usually have our back. So I think definitely take more risks. I'm not somebody who ever advises anybody quit their job or quit their degree program. I think you should engineer that opportunity so that it can actually work better for you. So that way you're not putting yourself at risk of financial insecurity, which is definitely the worst thing to do in this, in this economy, but you are taking some risks and investing some time to future-proof where you're actually going. Sure, okay. Um... Someone that says that they are, sorry, the question's gone again, that they are currently in between starting their new job and they've got about two months off. Other than starting to have read your book, what would you suggest that they do with this time before starting their new role? Oh, I think if you already know what you're going to do, you should get out and explore the world and meet people of, of different cultures and invest in cultivating um, a diverse network, to, to, to be very, very honest. So if you know you're about to do a bout of intense work, 
get out, enjoy yourself, and also cultivate that diverse boardroom. So who are the three people over the next year who you're going to ask for advice and who are going to be challenging of you, but always have their back? And I think that's the key to feedback, which I didn't really answer properly when you asked that question is, you're never going to take feedback very negatively if you know the person who's giving it to you has your best interest at heart and they're not trying to put you down and they want you to get ahead. So identifying those three people now before you start on the journey is definitely worth doing. But congratulations and going back to resilience, please celebrate this win and please celebrate what you've actually accomplished because it sounds like you've accomplished a lot. Yeah. Kirsty Rawlings asks, what is the trend in working age? Is it extending? And how realistic is it to achieve career progression or career change in your 50s? It is extending. So I think, you know, for a lot of people these days, they'll have to work well beyond 65, potentially to 70. Um, you know, if we look at the duration of mortgages and the type of work people are actually doing just to finalize the mortgage phase, because housing and education are so expensive. Yes, people are, are, are definitely going to be working longer. Um, and I think that pivots are, can happen at any age, you know, um, and we quite early on in the um, in, in the lecture, I was asked a question about portfolio careers. And I think this is really relevant for people who are over the age of 50 to think about three, four, five different things that they could be doing for an income stream. And I think also if you're approaching retirement, the idea of thinking broadly. So what can I actually do broadly in order to make sure that I actually secure myself for income and really enjoy this kind of last 10 years that I might actually have um, on the labor market. And these type of jobs include kind of board advice, public speaking, mentoring, advocation, um, and a bunch of things that you don't actually think you can do for paid work that now are available for paid work. Um, Harpreet Gill asks, or she says, um, resilience has been touted in healthcare and the word in some cases has been overused. In an underfunded healthcare system, can asking people to be more resilient be toxic if the system is not resilient? Yes, I think this is a really great question. For, for a long time, I've been really worried about the kind of trend within organisations to get people talking about mental health. And then there's nothing to actually help them for their mental health. So if I were to tell you today, uh, Jasmine, that I, I suffer from anxiety or I was to tell you that I suffer from depression, me telling you that and then nothing actually happening after that is probably going to actually be more damaging to me than be good to be kind of left there waiting for some for, for kind of some action to be taken. So I think this is a really, really great point. Um, I think the NHS is currently underfunded. I am a big fan of the IAP that has got into the IHS uh, into the NHS that is um, talk therapy in a way that has been shown medically to be quite effective uh, and can be delivered in something that I think is actually quite scalable in the system. But I do think employers um, do have a duty to uh, kind of provide counselling within the organisation walls and easy access counselling. You shouldn't be queuing for two weeks if you are somebody who is looking for help um, with mental health issue, whether it's mild or whether it's severe, that should be there for you, for your employer. So I'm hoping again over the next kind of 10 years, this purpose quest that we went on in COVID where lots of people talked about the purpose of their organization and care about their, caring about their employees will lead to having some better facilities um, onboarded. Yeah. I think I'm gonna to turn to our last question now, which is from Priyanka. Your advice to take small steps instead of a huge leap for a career change is really helpful and definitely less scary. While crafting these experiments to try out different things, what are some of the common pitfalls you see people falling into and how can you avoid them? I think it's time. I think, you know, as human beings, we gravitate towards things that actually give us happiness in the moment instead of actually investing in things that will secure our future self. So the pitfalls tends to be procrastination. Um, it tends to be narratives. So people are kind of convincing themselves they're not good enough they don't necessarily need to change, that they don't have time to change. And really battling against that is something, particularly if you're just starting out in your journey, that you just have to do as a mechanism for self-growth. 
I bracket my time into three different buckets. So the things that give me joy in the moment and happiness, but add value to nobody else's life. So that's kind of like me vegging out in front of Netflix and watching a series, which I will say I did this weekend. So this is a really bad day for my procrastination. I'm, I'm feeling I'm feeling guilt. The second are the things that I do for the future to invest in my future or more now to invest in the future of people in the inclusion initiative, things that will have kind of will take effort now and we might not necessarily see payoff for a while. And then the third are the things that just waste your time. So useless meetings, surfing the Internet. And really what you want to do is cut out that last bucket. So make sure that you're not spending time in things that don't add value to you or others who you care about. You curtail the first bucket, which gives me happiness to veg out on Netflix, but I probably shouldn't do it for my entire life. And you move towards investing in that person who you're going to be in five and 10 years time. And this pension companies now over in Silicon Valley have AI where you get to age yourself. I finally got to do this, by the way, um, after talking about it for so long, where you get to age yourself and see what you look like. And also they tell you what your finances will allow you do when you get to 65, 70. And I think it would be really cool to bring that in for the next five years and to show people if today you just changed what you did for 90 minutes, two hours a week in order to move towards a career that you will enjoy more, that kind of maybe you earn more, maybe it's in a very, very different field to what you're in now. But you just invest that 90 minutes, two hours now every single day. Um, what will a compounding effect actually be like? And that's what we're kind of leaning in on here, these compounding effects. And to see yourself visually, I think it's going to make it all easier. In the meantime, I do think check out chapter two if, of, of, of Think Big, where I talk a lot about the tips that you can actually um, bring in on a day to day basis. And if I can take one more minute, Jasmine, um, Julia had a question about unions, which has gone about the kind of roller unions. Yes. And, and I think, unfortunately, Julia, we need unions now more than ever. Um, some of the things that I talked about in the beginning of the conversation where you have some people who are being kind of swept along and their work being made easier by technology and some people where their jobs are being eroded, um, they need the, the second group really need the unions in order to fight for them because the governments at the moment haven't set that transition period up to be pain-free. And without the unions, I think you might have bigger people, bigger number of people um, without a living wage and also wider um, wider inequality. So I'm I'm definitely at this moment in time. I think we need the we need the unions more than ever. Um, and my last thing before we go, I want to thank everyone for the privilege of their time. Um, I, I've taken an hour of yours. I hope you've enjoyed it. And over to Jasmine to advertise the rest of the festival. Yes. So we again thank you for everyone who's joined and your questions. I'm excited to announce that Alexandra, Sonia, and Yikbo Ting are the winners of the question competition. So please reach out to CII, the email address, and we will get those posted out to you. Um, as we mentioned, you can learn more about the online um, Inclusive Leaders Behavioural Science course, which graces the course convener from. And now that we have to leave you, please join the rest of the festival sessions tomorrow. Um, Dr. Jonathan Roberts from the Marshall Institute will be talking about how to do good and create social impact in today's landscape. So thank you so much for joining and for your time. We hope to see you again soon and make sure to sign up to the Inclusion Initiatives newsletters to stay up to date with our events. Thank you, Carol. Thank you, Jasmine. You're really awesome. I really appreciate it. Bye. Bye.